continue today on our journey through the Christmas hymns of Isaac Watts and the nativity-centered scriptures, obviously, that they, they spring from. In fact, as I even sing all these other Christmas hymns, my mind starts linking to some passages in Luke and other places. And so we'll be send, spending Advent kind of springboarding off of Isaac Watts' passion. Because it's evident what passages struck the chord of his emotions during those compositions. Um, his verses will be a doorway to scripture verses as we worship together this season. As you guys may have heard last week, but you may be joining us for the first time, Isaac Watts. Uh, he was about 24 years old in 1702 when he received his call to the pastorate. And he, he became pastor and remained the pastor there until his death in 1748, 46 years of ministry. And in one sense, his, his sermons were a little more straightforward, uh, not dry, although some people might have seen them as that, but it was evident in his poetry and his letters and other aspects when he wasn't preaching from the pulpit, the poetry and the passion of scripture was evident through all of his other writings. Also, you think about when he was writing those, he was often plagued by ill health. I don't know about you, when I'm of ill health, I don't write, write things that are joyous, typically. But in his, in his infirmity, he was devoted to focusing on the joys and wonders of God in writing. They kind of flowed unceasingly from his pen, as one commentator said. And I'm sure he read the passage we'll begin with here. I'm going to read it first this week before we go through the hymn. Because it's evident, if we read Luke chapter 2, verses 1 through 20, We'll see then, as we see Isaac Watts' hymn, how it fashioned his poetry. And this is obviously a familiar passage to many of you. So I'll pray. Some of you even heard it said by Linus this time of year. But we'll go through it again, nevertheless. Father, we thank you this morning that we can open your word. And God, as we listen to the words of your inspired writer, Luke, and then we see how that, in a lesser but important way, inspired the heart of Isaac Watts. Help it to catch fire in our own hearts. Let these inspirations continue to fuel the flames of your people, of your bride, the church, and all of us as parts of it. In your name, amen. Well, in those days, a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world would be registered. This was the first registration when Quirinius was governor of Syria, and all went to be registered, each to his own town. And Joseph also went up from Galilee, from the town of Nazareth, to Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David, to be registered with Mary, his betrothed, who was with child. And while they were there, the time came for her to give birth, and she gave birth to her firstborn son, wrapped him in swaddling cloths, laid him in a manger because there was no place for them in the inn. And in the same region there were shepherds out in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them. The glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were filled with great fear. And the angel said to them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in swaddling cloths and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest and on earth peace among those with whom he is pleased. And the angels went away from them into heaven. The shepherds said to one another, Let, let us go over to Bethlehem and see this thing that's happened, which the Lord has made known to us. And they went with haste. They found Mary and Joseph and the baby lying in a manger. And when they saw it, they made known the saying that had been told them concerning this child. And all who heard it wondered at what the shepherds had told them. But Mary treasured up all these things, pondering them in her heart. And the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen as it had been told them. We'll see now how Watts, Isaac Watts reading this passage would have released his emotion in poetry and hymn, but not emotions devoid of deep and informed theology. So you hear this poetic verse, understand that we'll follow up by looking at the rich scriptural points that it has to make. Kathy? Yeah. 
Shepherds, rejoice. Lift up your eyes and send your fears away. News from the region of the skies, salvation's born today. Jesus, the God whom angels fear, comes down to dwell with you. Today he makes his entrance here, but not as monarchs do. No gold, nor purple swaddling bands, nor royal shining things. A manger for his cradle stands and holds the king of kings. Go, shepherds, where the infant lies and see his humble throne. With tears of joy in all your eyes, go, shepherds, kiss the sun. Thus Gabriel sang and straight around the heavenly armies throng. They tune their harps to lofty sound and thus conclude the song. Glory to God that reigns above. Let peace surround the earth. Mortals shall know their maker's love at their redeemer's birth. Lord, and shall angels have their songs and men no tunes to raise? Oh, may we lose our useless tongues when they forget to praise. Glory to God that reigns above that pitied us forlorn. We join to sing our maker's love, for there's a savior born. We have a few things to focus on as we go in. I want to take us on a little excursus. So you've heard the poetry, and as I began, we start even just with the title. Shepherds rejoice, lift up your eyes. Most of us approach Christmas and these carols and even a poem like this. Most of us probably already have our eyes up. Most of us have already sung some, song, sung some songs and we're already rejoicing. But if you are told to do something, what does it usually mean you're doing? Well, not that, right? Rejoice. Lift up your eyes. I was thinking of an exa as an example, right? When, when my dad, when it's time for Christmas dinner, my dad would say, boys, come to the table. We weren't at the table. Right? The great commandments we even have from our Lord and Savior, love God and love your neighbor. They wouldn't need to be commandments if they were innate, if they were autonomic. Right? When an angel commands, rejoice, lift up your eyes, that means they were not rejoicing. That means their eyes were where? Down. Right? It's too easy sometimes, I think, for us to understand how amazing this is and miss a little bit of the gravity that's happening. In fact, at Christmas time, it's very easy to miss the gravity of what we're celebrating. We have the Hallmark Channel, we have warm Starbucks lattes, right? And so when we hear this, maybe I read, Rejoice, lift up your eyes, and it just sounds like, keep doing what you're doing, just do it a little more. We skipped over some very important steps that I don't want us to miss. And I don't think Isaac Watts wants us to miss it either. Because he uses a phrase three times, which we'll get to. It's interesting, my wife and I were watching, we watched the Macy's Day Parade. Anybody do that? Thanksgiving tradition? And we all know what comes at the end of that, right? In the last few weeks, I'm even guessing, now I'm guessing the last few weeks, some of you have started to see a familiar face everywhere, a very popular myth. Visiting children, people start watching their favorite movie about him. I, I probably don't even need to say his name, but let's let's all say it together, okay? Let's say it. one, two, three, Krampus. Wait, say it. <laughs> Krampus. December fifth, if you didn't know, was Krampus not? Nicholas himself, the Saint Nicholas, who would inspire stories which we'd later have become the myth of Santa Claus, they became popular in Germany around the 11th century, including a feast dedicated to this patron of children, Saint Nicholas. That's where we get our Santa Claus mythology, right? However, in Europe, pointedly Austria and Bavaria, by the 17th century, Krampus had been incorporated into Christian winter celebrations by pairing Krampus with Saint Nicholas. The Feast of St. Nicholas is celebrated in parts of, it's on 6th December, so you have the Feast of St. Nicholas on the 6th, so what do you have on the eve of that? Or on the preceding evening, Krampus night, this wicked, hairy character appears on the streets. Sometimes he's even accompanying St. Nicholas on his journey. There's St. Nicholas and Krampus showing up. Looks like that kid was on the naughty list. Right? Now, in... In this traditional folklore, St. Nicholas would actually be wearing vestments. He looked very much more like a Christian 
almost a priestly bishop kind of character with a golden staff. And St. Nicholas would concern himself with the good children. And the bad children got to deal with this wonderful looking long-toned character with goat horns. Nicholas would dispense the gifts and Krampus would supply the coal or actually worse. He carried chains thought to symbolize the binding of the devil by the Christian church. And he would thrash the chains for dramatic effect. Chains were sometimes accompanied with bells of various sizes. He'd carry birch branches with which he would swat the children. In fact, the birch branches were replaced by a whip in some representations. Sometimes he would appear with a sack or a basket strapped to his back to cart off the evil children for either eating or transport to hell. Some of the older versions even make mention of naughty children being, yeah, they're put in the bag, they're taken away. This is an actual Krampus celebration from 1932. There's St. Nicholas going from home to home, Krampus right there, two steps behind, with his chains going together to see who's naughty or nice. You're like, wow, that's a very strange ancient tradition. Well, this is just down the street from our house last night, 2019. Uh, there was Krampus at the uh, Nile of Golf Course. Kat and I went and checked it out. There was even a little Krampus play. St. Nicholas came out and gave an appeal to be good. Krampus came out and said many had not been good. And then literally the devil came out, someone dressed like the devil and, and warned that torment awaits those who don't do good. And then St. Nicholas ended by admonishing parents to train up their sons and daughters to be good. Now your initial response to this might be, oh, but you know what I can't, as I studied this this week, I decided I kind of like Krampus. And I don't mean I like Krampus, but as we're talking about parallels, parables, folklore, and mythology, I have to ask myself, what has the Feast of St. Nicholas devolved into over a few hundred years? All right? In the earliest and most famous incidents of Nicholas's life in history, he is said to have rescued, get this, part of the idea of St. Nicholas before he became termed Santa Claus and kind of turned into a myth. He said to have rescued three girls from being forced into prostitution by dropping a sack of gold coins through the window of their house each night for three nights so that their father could pay a dowry for each of them. Saving women lost to what would have been a truly hellish fate. Probably worse than a mythical thrashing from a Krampus. But yet, what do we have instead of St. Nicholas today? Be good kitties, or you might not get a toy. Wink, right? That's what we've reduced a St. Nicholas to. That's what we've reduced, in many ways, Christmas to. No gravity. All substance from St. Nicholas taken away. And even worse, the nativity. All gravity taken away. All right, Christmas is time for fun and a wink, and like it, worst comes to worst, oh no, you just got a lump of coal. All right, let's return to Isaac Watts' poetry. In the midst of all this rejoicing, what gets emphasized three times that we can miss? Shepherds rejoice, lift up your eyes, and send your fears away. We're then told Jesus is who? The God whom angels fear. And then we're told what he does banishes their fears. And his messenger angel banishes the shepherd's fears. Three times fear is talked about. Where we're also told they're commanded to rejoice. And joy gets mentioned several times. But we have to understand there's a juxtaposition. Do I truly get joy? Unless I understand that that joy is taking a fear that I need to use the word. It needs to be banished. Something powerful has a grip on me. And I need it to be banished if I'm going to have any joy. Right, we think about the shepherds in this time that Watts and, of course, Luke is telling us about. These shepherds would have known the words of the prophet Daniel. And in Daniel, we know that he said, this is one of the prophecies of Daniel in the Old Testament. At that time shall arise Michael, the great prince who has charge of your people. And there shall be a time of trouble such as never been since there was a nation till that time. But at that time, your people shall be delivered. Everyone whose name shall be found written in the book. 
And many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life, and some to shame and everlasting contempt. And those who are wise shall shine like the brightness of the sky above, and those who turn many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. Right? That would have been the prophecy that the shepherds knew. Hey, someday somebody's coming, and the gift they bring will be something you reap forever and ever. Some to everlasting life, and some to shame and everlasting contempt. That's a little worse than a piece of coal in my stocking. Like this coming day of judged, naughty or nice, was in their heads. And then, of course, what do we get from the coming of Jesus as we read in the Gospel of John? Jesus himself says, For the Father judges no one, but has given all judgment to the Son. That all may honor the Son just as they honor the Father. Whoever does not honor the Son does not honor the Father who sent him. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever hears my word and believes him who has sent me has eternal life. He does not come into judgment, but is passed from death to life. Truly, truly, I say to you, an hour is coming and is now here when the dead shall hear the voice of the Son of God, and those who hear will live. For as the Father has life in himself, so he's granted the Son also to have life in himself, and he has given him authority to execute judgment because he is the Son of Man. Do not marvel at this, for an hour is coming when all who are in the tombs will hear his voice and come out, those who have done good to the resurrection of life, and those who have done evil to the resurrection of of judgment. So I ask you, from our Old Testament to our New Testament, apart from a miracle that we need, which myth is closer to our reality? Which one truly expresses a desperate need for nativity? Winking St. Nick? Or a coupled parallel of judgment? Nicholas and Krampus. Revelation 20, verse 11 says, Then I saw a great white throne and him who was seated on it. From his presence, earth and sky fled away, and no place was found for them. And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne. And books were opened. Then another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged by what was written in the books according to what they had done. And if anyone's name was found not written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. Speaking of heaven in chapter 21, it says, but nothing unclean will ever enter it, heaven, nor anyone who does what is detestable or false, but only those who are written in the Lamb's book of life. Right? This is the juxtaposition I need to have in my head and heart, is that there is reason to fear apart from this nativity. I have real fears because if I really assess myself, is there any naughty on my list? Yes. Apart from the saving grace of Jesus, do all of us have naughty on our list? Yeah, we're not on the nice list. There's a book. Are we written in it? Well, apart from a miracle, apart from something that can send fears away, banish those fears, Someone whom even the angels fear that can come in and do something dramatic and miraculous to change everything. We're in big trouble. Right? We do not understand Christmas unless we first understand fear. We really don't. I was thinking that Krampus would shake the chains. That's even what Charles Dickens would work into when Marley comes with the heavy admonition before the transformation of Scrooge. What does Marley come in? He's dragging chains and lockboxes, and he shakes them, and he wails. Because there is something to fear apart from salvation. The gravity of our situation, we're all found wanting. And this isn't about a year, if I've been good this year. It's, this is about eternal life. It's bigger. I need, a I need a messenger from God to tell me I don't need to be afraid. I need a messenger from God to tell me that I can lift my eyes, because otherwise, like James, you have any sin? They're going down. I saw I want us to focus on, we see in Isaac Watts writing, four things that Jesus is, and four things that Jesus does. Now, these are the things that just banish that fear. He gives us four things in the song as we look through. That first of all, he's very clear, as is John as is 
much of your New Testament scripture, as is much of the prophecy before we get to it. But it's just not that Jesus is a good teacher. Jesus is the God-man. Last week we saw in one of his hymns, he talks about how he is, he, he emphasizes that humanness of Jesus, fully human, fully man. But here he's emphasizing the God-man, Jesus, the God whom angels fear, comes down to dwell with you. Not, not a transformed angel, not a good teacher, not some special human imbued with some kind of godly superpowers. He's not like the judges, like Samson we see in the Old Testament. He's not like Moses, Moses who's just gifted with God's power through occasions. Here we have a strong phrase that reinforces he isn't just supreme over us and under God, but is God. John 1's clear. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. In fact, it's why they killed him. They pick up stones to throw at Jesus before the crucifixion. Several times there's angry crowds. And he's like, why do you stone me? He said, because you, a man, claim to be God. And that's true. Even by Old Testament law, either he was God, or that's blasphemy and he deserves death. Scripture's clear that he was God. If I need someone to banish my fears because before a holy and righteous God I stand condemned, who can take care of that? That God can. He could do a miracle. And he's done it by dwelling with us, the incarnation of Jesus Christ. And so here we have then, well, what would I expect if I go before a king and I have a whole bunch of naughty on my list? I have a whole bunch of sin on my life. I have a life stained by it. I would expect a king to do what is just and condemn me. But here, even from his birth, we see clearly that Jesus is, as Isaac Watts articulates, an atypical monarch. Right? Today he makes his entrance here, but not as monarchs do. No gold, nor purple, no swaddling bands, nor royal shining things. A manger for his cradle stands and holds the king of kings. Right? People expected a king as they looked at the prophecies and thought that Messiah would come someday in the Old Testament, they had a very radical view of what it would be. In fact, many of them thought well, he's going to be an earthly king and he's going to be like I expect a king to be. He doesn't come as we would expect. We'll talk a little bit more about his kingship next week. And you know, the honest, the truth is they already had an example of this, right? Like here they had all this prophecy, but yet they were still kind of expecting Jesus to come like they'd Kind of picked Saul back in the day. You guys know the difference between the, the, the way the Old Testament worked? People said, we want a king. All the other nations have a king. We want a king like this. We want to be like everybody else. And Jesus said, all right, give you what you want. Gave him Saul. How's that working out for you? Not very good. And he looked like a king should look. And he stood like a king should look. And he probably talked like a king should look. I mean, he, he had that deep James Earl Jones voice. I mean, he, he, was, he was the typical monarch. And it didn't work out so well for Israel. So God then picked this shepherd boy who was seemingly, by, all, by some accounts, you know, so maybe he was the runt of the litter, he's at least the youngest, he's, he's the, the least likely in the house of Jesse to be the main man. And he doesn't, even, he doesn't even become first in his household, he becomes first over all of Israel. A little boy that slays Goliath. It looks ridiculous proportionately. God was always kind of communicating and hinting that he would come all throughout Scripture in a way that was atypical. And yet we still miss it because we're thick. We think sometimes we look back and we judge people in Jesus' time as if we wouldn't have been equally as numbskulled. Isaiah 53 said he'd have the Messiah had no noble beauty to mark his face. He, would not, he was not going to be as we expected. So, of course, he shows up and he's not as we expected, and we didn't expect it. God shows that he's even right in his prophecies about us that we'll miss the point. And then we get to this, the contrast to the fear. Unless I understand how dire my situation is, and then I, I something worse than a Krampus actually could have full right to grab me, and I could be tormented forever. Here we have Jesus is the joy bringer. And if my fate 
would be somebody grabbing the back of my neck and hurling me into fire. To bring the glorious news, a heavenly form appears. This angel, as Isaac Watts elucidates, he tells the shepherds of their joys and banishes their fear. Right? Jesus brings real joy. Notice the messengers from God. I love even the phrasing there. He tells the shepherds of their joys. And who? Did the shepherds define what joy was? No, it's like, hey, I'm going to tell you what your joy is. I'm going to define your joy for you. Here's your joy. This Messiah is coming in this way, and he's what you need. Like on any given day, you can ask me what, what makes you happy. Like, I probably have all the wrong answers. <laughs> right, we chase false joys all over the place. It's like this, and we all, of course, we all think, like, well, this will give me. Nope, this won't give me joy. Here's your joy. The God you should rightly fear, the God who can justly put you in chains, he has another path. For all who put their faith in Jesus Christ. Real joy is here. Eternal joy is here. Rejoice. And guess what? Yes, apart from Jesus, you're in your sin. But guess what? I'm sending Jesus. You can lift up your eyes. Your countenance can gaze skyward with hope and confidence and a smile. Real joy is here. Our eyes are on things down here. So many times that's the problem too. Our eyes are, we don't even realize as we look at the things we think give us joy on this life, we're still downcast. Right? Lift up your eyes. Joy is coming from above, from heaven, from God. And the only way it works is because Jesus is worthy. Right? He's the worthy. The only one. In worship so divine, let saints employ their tongues. With the celestial hosts we join and loud repeat their songs. And then and Isaac Watts includes the admonition, Lord, and shall angels have their songs and men no tunes to raise? Oh, may we lose our useless tongues when they forget to praise. Just a little bit of a switch being applied. Lord, will men have no tunes to raise? May we lose our useless tongues when we forget to praise. Hebrews 3 tells us Jesus had been counted worthy of more glory than Moses. Again, more than Moses is much more glory, as much more glory as the builder of a house has more honor than the house itself. For every house is built by somebody, but the builder of all things is God. Now Moses is faithful over all God's house as a servant to testify to the things that were spoken later, but Christ is faithful over God's house as a son, and we are his house. If indeed we hold fast our confidence and our boasting in our hope. Right? Moses, all the people that were part of the house of God, they're the house. Well, who are we told Jesus is? He owns the house. Worthy. Revelation 5.12 says, we, we hear in scripture, people say with a loud voice at the end days, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. Worthy in every way. He's worthy to judge. Guess what? There's not going to be Nicholas or Krampus at the end of days. Worthy to judge. Jesus. Jesus alone. Worthy of worship like the shepherds do. The shepherds go and they worship Jesus. Worthy to receive glory and honor and power. He says before he ascended into heaven, all authority has been given to me. That's why this is so amazing. That's why then we see four things that Jesus does in this poem. And the first one we see is he's the one who is removing the fear. Jesus removes fear. John the Baptist's dad, Zechariah. Before the forerunner to Jesus came, his dad was prophesying and filled with the Holy Spirit. He said, blessed be the Lord of God of Israel, for he's visited and redeemed his people. He's raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David to show mercy, promised to our fathers. We talked about that at least last week, that Christ was promised. To remember his holy covenant, the oath he swore to our father Abraham to grant us that we, being delivered from the hand of our enemies, might serve him without fear in holiness and righteousness before him all our days. Jesus removes fear. Jesus sends, is sent because our faithful, loving God honors his covenant with his people. Sent, and then of course, as we hear in 
many of these songs, Jesus dwells with us. That's why he's called Emmanuel, God with us. Jesus, the God whom angels fear, has come to dwell with you. God whose angels fear. As even if like, the devil is not ruling in hell, right? Devil and the angels who are fallen, the angels who are sinful, like, they know and fear Jesus. They tremble. Go see him. Go shepherds where the infant lies and see his humble throne. With tears of joy in all your eyes, go shepherds, kiss the sun. Can you imagine that? You've just been told the Messiah and Savior are here. The Holy One of Israel has arrived, and you can not only go see him, you can touch him. You can literally kiss. Kiss the cheek of God with us. Your lips can give a kiss to God in the flesh. Like the maker of the universe. Think about that. I think about even, like, you think about it in the Old Testament, even the idea of getting close to it, you would see it. To look on him would mean death. I was like, go up and, go up and kiss God incarnate? I feel like my face is going to melt off like Raiders of the Lost Ark. Like, you know, like in these shepherds, like this isn't metaphor. They literally got to go see the baby Jesus. Physical. They could touch, hold, Messiah. How mind-boggling is that? Like that shows that Jesus loves us. It shows that God and his love are perfect. Glory to God that reigns above, let peace surround the earth. I love this line, maybe my favorite line. Mortals shall know their maker's love at their redeemer's birth. Mortals shall know their maker's love. First John says, by this, is love perfected with us so that we may have confidence for the day of judgment. Because as he is, as he is, so also are we in this world. There is no fear in love. I'll say it again. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. For fear has to do with punishment, and whoever fears has not been perfected in love. We love because he first loved us. Amen. Amen. Love has been perfected with us. The love of Jesus casts out the fear. That's the banishing that Isaac Watts is singing about. And last, of course, Jesus saves us. Shepherds rejoice, lift up your eyes and send your fears away. News from the regions of the skies. Salvations born today. This is I mean, this is the field goal. This is the football verse, right? John 3, 16. Sometimes too familiar in our minds, too familiar that we lose its resonance and gravity, right? For this is how God loved the world. That he gave his only son. That whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe is condemned already. Because he's not believed in the name of the only Son of God. Right? That's, that is the reality that we live in. That is the tension as Christians, and that is the gospel that we preach. Right? That judgment is coming. There is no wink. There is no gifts or just kind of a lame gift. I mean, even coal, I guess you could light the fire. You could put the coal in the fireplace or something. A real judgment is coming, not in the form of Santa or Krampus. But they simply, they actually don't make a very poor parable or fable that you could springboard from. Metaphor. And apart from a miracle, I am on a list that is not the book of life. All mankind is on that list because of our sin, and yet, somehow that gets changed by the gospel. Right? Good things to offset. Don't we? we don't have a balance the scales religion. I don't have to tally up my bad stuff and make sure I do enough nice list stuff to sort of offset the weight. 
That doesn't redeem or actually make good on all those bad things. Great, I helped this person over there, but by terrible to this person over here, I can't, can't somehow just make that go away. It's not a scale balancing issue. Someone else needs to deal with that. Or I'm in trouble. Even Jesus, when he grew up, would teach and speak in parables. So some of you are talking, well, I, I think the Krampus and Santa thing is too confusing. I don't want to use that for a springboard. Well, I'll give you another springboard today as we close from Matthew 22. Because a parallel or a metaphor used by Jesus is always going to be superior to any silly holiday thing we might come up with. But it deals with a feast. Matthew 22, Jesus spoke to them in parables saying, The kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king, gave a wedding feast for his son, sent his servants to call those who were invited to the wedding feast. They wouldn't come. And he said to his servants, the wedding feast is ready. In verse 8 he says, those invited were not worthy. Go therefore to the main roads and invite to the wedding feast as many as you find. And those servants went out on the roads and gathered all whom they found. Bad, good. So the wedding was filled with guests. But when the king came in to look at the guests, he saw a man who had no wedding garment. And he said to him, friend, how did you get in here? without a wedding garment. The man was speechless. The king said to his attendants, bind him hand and foot and cast him into the outer darkness in that place where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth for many are called but few are chosen. Now what does this mean? I can tell you right away, this isn't about how we dress. The question that derives from that, so I go, if yeah, this is a parable, if this, I'm supposed to understand that this has resonance to something real, what, what's my wedding garment? Right, it's a tradition we, we don't normally, and who, who wore their wedding garment to the wedding feast last time? I mean, it's not, maybe if you're part of the main party, you wear a tux, or that's a little bit lost to culture, so you have to unpack it. That's what says, glory to God that reigns above, that pitied us forlorn. We join to sing our maker's love, for there's a savior born. Right? Christ and Christ's righteousness is our wedding garment. Right? We're on the naughty list. All mankind is on the naughty list because of our sin. But God chooses to love us by sending us a covering, a garment of righteousness. Right? Watts tells us mortals will know their maker's love. Christ's righteousness, a garment that is spotless, and not only a spotless covering, but one that as he drapes us in it, begins cleaning us inside and out. Sanctification is the word for that. Right? He gave up his life on the cross in exchange for those things on my list. They were put on his. He took the punishment, not from a Krampus, let's be clear, but again, think of the metaphor. Even the metaphor of that Krampus, whipping, torment, taken to the grave. That's, that happened to Jesus. When he rose again on the third day, amen? Beat Satan's sin and death. Our fears are banished when our hope and trust is in Jesus Christ. That the punishment he bore then allows me to be clothed in a wedding garment which makes me suitable for the feast. Suitable for the kingdom of God. Someday I'm going to stand at the gates of heaven, the throne of judgment, the ultimate Christmas feast. And I'm standing there apart from Christ. I'm not getting in even if I have a bunch of things to say where I was nice. That word, and I'm not even, to, and even if I'm clothed in Christ's righteousness, I'm not able to enter because Jesus, the word nice doesn't begin to cover what Christ has done for us. Lord, and shall angels have their songs and men no tunes to raise? Oh, may we lose our useless tongues when they forget the praise. We celebrate this great, great, unfathomable, mysterious, wholly sufficient gift that God has given to us. A gift that takes away fear, not just a gift that feels good, 
gift that offsets what should be terror. That differential should make me rejoice more than any other kind of gift or metaphor I can think of. I can go from terror to absolute rejoicing looking at the face of my Maker, my Savior, and my Lord. I pray all of us experience the wonder and magnitude of a fear-banished joy this Christmas. And I thank the richness of Christians throughout history like Isaac Watts, who would juxtapose joy and fear in that way that should make my heart sing louder than anything else that could make me happy. Let's pray. Father, as we meditate on the nativity this year, let us make sure that the magnitude really hits us. God, as shepherds would have been trembling at not a parable not a fable, not mythology, but the reality of real angels, messengers of God, appearing before them in the middle of the night as they would have been struck with abject terror, like maybe something from a horror movie. Then to have that quelled with God's message that fear is banished, that joy is here, that Savior is here, God, help us to understand the depths of what it would be like apart from the grace of God so that we truly lift up our eyes and lift up our voices and lift up our lives in an eternal celebration of what we've been brought from and to. In your name.